A judge in Minneapolis siding with residents who sued the city over police staffing levels. They said the city failed to keep an adequate number of officers required by the city's charter. Violent crime spiking nationwide, so will other cities follow suit? Joining us now is our chief legal analyst, Dr. Laura McNeil. Dr. McNeil, thanks for being with us. Eight residents filing the, the lawsuit, they said the crime was spiking and that there weren't enough police. But here's the nuance. They said it wasn't about maintaining a sufficient level of officers necessary as opposed to adding more officers. Explain that subtle difference. Yes, and so they, they essentially are saying that based on the city's uh, charter, they're required, uh, based on their own words, their own agreement, uh, to add have 0 0.117 sworn officers per resident. Um, and essentially what they're saying is they wanted the city to meet that legal obligation they had. They felt like adding more officers would help curb the crime that we see. And, and I want to say really quickly that the crime has been very significant. I mean, as to date, meaning as of May, there were a little bit about two months ago, there were 41 deaths in Minnesota, uh, in Minneapolis specifically. Now this time last year, there was 28. And so the, the rise in crime uh, is at record numbers. And so um, I can see or rather understand why uh, the individuals, those eight individual community members wanted to bring this lawsuit, hoping they can help curb crime. They also said, and this was interesting, that this decision doesn't clash with the message of Black Lives Matter. They, they say they all want police accountability, but communities of color have to work with uh, the police departments. Does this puncture a hole at all in the defund the police movement, or is this something entirely different? Um, it does, because in one sense, they're saying it doesn't clash with Black Lives Matter, but it does clash. When you think of it from the perspective that one of the biggest complaints in urban cities is the issue of over-policing our communities. So having more officers in our communities than our white counterparts. And the reason this is very important is because what it, it does is it results in a rise in stops and low-level arrests, as we saw with the Dante Wright case, when you're over-policing communities of color and so in that sense it does create situations that are more likely to have officers violating residents constitutional rights to not be victims of excessive use of force and so uh, it's one of those issues where is the question Dale reforming the police or defunding the police in this case uh, some police departments I think can't be reformed some of them you need a complete makeover and it's not enough to just add more officers to an already toxic and racist situation and system. Dr. Laura as you know for this network I, I took an investigative look at this for two years in fact and, and spent a lot of time working on it and one of the things that I did was took a look at the issue from the standpoint of a business. If police were a business, if it were a Fortune 500 company, would you continue to give them the money that you do? And then I looked at other agencies like the FBI, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, where the pay was better uh, and, and the, the rate of violence seemed to be lower. So it's not as easy as more police or, or, or less police. But in this case, the city has had issues keeping officers on the job in, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and all the protest. Is there any indication from what you're seeing about how the city is going to go about trying to recruit officers when it's tough? Um, yes, it is tough right now uh, for police officer recruitment efforts, but the city has a responsibility, as you gave with the analogy with any business, to create an environment uh, that is going to be enticing for recruits, to create an environment where police officers uh, feel that not only they are valued, uh, but they're also protected, uh, but they also understand their responsibility to be accountable for their own actions. And so I think this is not as easy as people make it seem. Oh, we're just defund the police. Oh, we're just add more police officers. No, we have to directly target the cultures of these police officers. And the first thing that comes to mind, I saw that a police chief in Ohio uh, was recently suspended on administrative leave for putting a KKK note on the coat of a black officer. Now, that's a perfect example of is adding more police to that Ohio department going to make a change or do you have to change the culture, change the leadership, put safeguards in place to ensure that police are held accountable. And so really we have to look at this from a system perspective, not individual officers. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lore, it is also difficult because departments refuse to abandon the culture of policing. Uh, in many senses, they are a holdover of the military. You have a sergeant, you have a lieutenant, uh, they have the stripes on the uniform, that rank. 
they don't really want to be viewed differently when you think about private security, for instance, for Hollywood movie stars. They simply show up in plain clothes, they drive around, but they've got their gun on them. Everybody knows they're packing. So there is a big difference when it comes to how we are protected by police and how they are protected by police. So how do we get to that point in the dialogue? I think really we have to have more community oversight and involvement, meaning we need to assign community-based officers, meaning people that are in the community that are willing to step up, deacons from our local churches, and they can do ride-alongs with these officers where you have someone there that is, again, an extra eye of accountability. But I think that's the only way because the reality is, you're right, the blue code is still intact and a lot of the police departments simply don't want to change things. They want things to be business as usual, and that's why we have a responsibility as community members, as activists for police reform to force them to change the culture. And that comes with accountability and more oversight. I'm curious from your time on the ground in, in Minneapolis, are you more optimistic today than you were a year ago or less optimistic? Uh, to be honest with you, I'm more optimistic and only because of the public scrutiny that is now on police reform and police actions. People are actually paying attention. Uh, there are people in the suburbs that are now acknowledging what we've known for years, which is systemic racism is alive and well within our police departments and our criminal justice system. Prior to the tragic killing of George Floyd, a lot of people simply didn't think it was that prevalent, didn't think it was that widespread, but it has forced them to recognize that it's a dual system still exists and more important that we all have an individual responsibility to do our part to dismantle that system.